Amen, amen. 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 11. By the way, I do give you permission uh, if the Lord touches you. Not that you need my permission, but people are funny about that. You, and the Lord touches you and, you, and you, you feel like you're healed, you can shout, you can scream, and you can say, I'm healed uh, from the moment that you experience that. You're, you're good to go, amen? Because God doesn't need my permission to heal you, and you don't need my permission to get healed. But you can. All right, 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 11. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sako which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Zacho and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in a line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. A cubit was about 18 inches, so basically a little more than nine feet tall, okay? And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. I don't know how much that is. It's just a lot. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders, and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I, not, am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants in service. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, I'm going to start out by talking something that may seem like I'm talking politics, but I'm not talking politics. It's just words that are used. There is a word today that's often used called propaganda. In, in Spanish, propaganda is used quite a bit to talk about any kind of advertising, uh, whatever the case may be. Today, we use propaganda. Mainly, we use it in the political realm. And uh, what does it mean? Propaganda is defined as the dissemination of information, facts, arguments, rumors, half-truths, or lies, and the purpose of it is to influence public opinion, okay? So what is taking place in our text, I would liken to a propaganda campaign. What is a propaganda campaign? Of itself, a campaign is defined as a planned group of especially political, business, or military activities that are intended to achieve a particular aim. So when combined with the word propaganda, the definition of a propaganda campaign is a planned group of especially political, business, or military activities that include facts, arguments, rumors, half-truths, or lies to influence an outcome. Kind of like what we see happen today in the media. That's my opinion. But since I'm preaching, I get to express my opinion. My contention is that the Philistines, in bringing out Goliath, were really implementing a propaganda campaign. To what purpose? To influence the Israelites to somehow steal their faith and to ultimately cause them to submit to the rule of the Philistines over their lives. So, that's the introduction. Let's jump into it and see what kind of things we can learn here. So the first point we want to look at is the enemy seeks to magnify the problems that we can see. All right? And again, if we were to go back to our text, there came out from the camp of the Philistines a giant. It talks about how big he was. In verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. So in our text, there are things taking place that we must bring to the forefront that we can overlook if we just read the text uh, very quickly. And I want to highlight a little bit in this text. What we see is that the enemies of Israel are trying to defeat the Israelites in battle. Their plan is to bring, bring out their biggest and baddest soldier and challenge the Israelites to a one-on-one, mano-a-mano battle. 
in the description of Goliath, we have a man who is the most fearsome in appearance and the most intimidating in his talking. But what I want you to recognize, and oftentimes we forget, is that there is only one Goliath. They're not all Goliaths. There's only one. And this Goliath has never proven himself to the Israelites in battle. We've never seen his prowess. We've never seen him defeat anybody. We've never seen his... Uh, now, you can put a propaganda campaign together and say, this is how many people he's won. This is how many people uh, this, uh, that, that he's defeated. This is how many things. And all you have is information without being verified. And what they're doing is they're saying, this is Goliath. And they dress him up. And he's a big guy. But they dress him up in a warrior's uniform. We don't even know if he's been to battle anymore. We don't know that. But that's what the enemy does. And he takes this big person called Goliath, not your typical Philistine, dresses him up in an army uh, uh, uniform, and then presents him before the Israelites and tells the Israelites that in order to win this battle, you're going to have to go through Goliath. Now, this is not a part of the message that I preach, but I've always thought to myself, why did the Israelites let the enemy set the terms for the battle? Why do we allow the enemy to set the terms for the battle? Right? We have greater, the one that is greater that lives in us than he that lives in the world. We are not to be intimidated or to allow the enemy to set the terms. If you were to go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam should have and could have just said, I refuse to listen to this because he was there and said, no, the terms of the battle are changing. You don't get to talk. You're getting out of here. And he could have grabbed him by the back of the neck and if he had a tail, by the tail. And he could have thrown him out of the garden. He said, why could he have done that? Because God gave him the authority to do that. I give you the task of cultivating and keeping the garden. The word cultivate is to work it, to tend it, to, to take care of it. The word keep comes from the same word where we get the word watchman, to be a watchman on the walls over the garden, to protect the garden, to protect from what? Anything that would try to come in and, and cause problems in the garden. So Adam's job was to be a watchman, to be a, a sentry, to be a protector of the garden, which he did not do when he allowed the serpent to come in and start talking. Now, I want to tell you something. The enemy's good at talking. We need to stop being so good at listening. You see, we got to determine... I know I'm going off on a tangent, but we got to set the rules of engagement. I hear the enemy talk to me all the time, and I've learned how to do it. I said, no, I refuse to participate in that. I will not go down that road. I do not have to go down that road. That is not who I am. Shut up. In Jesus' name. <laughs> but you do not have to succumb. Now, he might come back again and again, and it might feel like you've gotta, you, you, that you have no way out, but you're, don't let him set the terms for the battle. You can set the terms for the battle, and the Israelites could have set the terms for the battle, but for some reason, they let the enemy set the terms. And you know what? The terms were, you got big Goliath, and you got little you. If you want to win this battle, you send the biggest you got, which is nowhere compared to the biggest we got. And, you know, I'm sure they're chuckling inside, we got this one. Because the Israelites didn't offer up any resistance. They just ran back into their tent, and they cowered in fear, maybe praying. Have you ever prayed out of fear? If they were praying, it wasn't out of faith. They were praying out of fear. God, please let something happen. And I'm sure the Lord was wanting something to happen, but it wasn't going to happen without one of the people there that were praying. You see, sometimes we're good at praying, but we're praying that God would do without us. But one of the things that we learn in the Bible is that God will do, but He often won't do without us. He's going to do it with us. There's a text in Matthew chapter 10 where it says, Pray for laborers. For the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few. So you know what starts happening 
we say, well, the Lord said pray for laborers. I better start praying for laborers. Oh, God, we need laborers. We need laborers. We don't have enough Sunday school teachers. We don't have enough. Let's just use that as an example. We need more Sunday school teachers. We're praying for Sunday school teachers. And the Lord begins to say, well, what about you? No, Lord, that ain't you. Or we say, no, I refuse to participate with that thought. <laughs> no, I have somebody else in mind. Just go talk to them. They're going to do a good job. No, the Lord is not talking to somebody else. The Lord is, you, listen, he'll listen to our prayers and he'll hear our prayers and they oftentimes will raise up other people, but many times he's looking at raising up us because we're the ones that are seeing the vision. Usually the one that has the vision, oftentimes what will happen is people will come to me and say, we need to do this, we need to do that. So they're seeing a need, they're seeing a lack, but they, they have this uh, uh, their wires are crossed and they think if there's a need, there's a lack, pastor needs to do something about it. Not realizing that if they're seeing the need and they're seeing the lack, more often than not, that's God's invitation. Something needs to be done and I'd like to use you. And that's where we start. Uh, 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 and we become Pentecostal real fast. <laughs> so, this is not the typical Philistine, yet to win this battle, the Israelites uh, were being told by the Philistines they were going to have to go through Goliath. This is, as I stated previously, a propaganda campaign. The enemy is using what is visible, a giant of a problem, to influence the, in, the invisible realm or the spiritual realm that we are in contact with. He's taking the things that we can see and using it to influence our faith the things that cannot be visibly seen. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So guess what? So if I can set up a big problem, my goal is to undermine your faith. I want to, I want to cut off your, this is the enemy's goal, to cut off your connection to the spiritual realm, to the heavenly realm, by creating a problem that, that uh, um, disrupts your Wi-Fi connection. Your faith in God. And that's what he seeks to do. Faith, which is what connects us with the Lord. I often say faith is the currency of the kingdom. That's a different metaphor. But there is power in the kingdom of God. There is power in the word of God. God is, by definition, omnipotent, which means it's all-powerful. His word is powerful, right? And so how do we allow the word of God to have access into our lives? It's through this this thing called faith. Faith is what opens the door for the power that's in the Word to manifest in our life. It's kind of like in these walls we have electricity. Electricity is not seen. You cannot see it. Well, how, but it's there. Well, how do I access and get that electricity into my life? I have a blow dryer that needs electricity to work. I have a razor. I don't have a blow dryer. I'm talking, my wife has a blow dryer. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny now. I can just kind of dry my hair with my towel, with my towel and I'm good to go, right? So um, anyway, I have, I do have other things that need, I have a charger for my phone that needs energy for it to be able to function. How do I access that energy? How do I access that power? I've got to plug into it. And faith is what allows us to plug into the power that's contained in God's Word. It's what opens the door and gives us access to the promises of God in our life. In, the, in our text, um, in 1 Samuel 17, we're going to read a little bit farther down, 37 and then 45 through 47, David shows up. And all the Israelites' uh, soldiers are hiding in their tents, and for 40 days, this Goliath is coming out and issuing the same propaganda campaign, propaganda campaign, propaganda campaign. So David shows up, he hears it, and he says, I I'll do something about it. And, and all of a sudden, people are like, well, good, if he does something about it, then we're off the hook. But of course, 
they know he, he's probably going to die because he's so little, he's so small, you know, but David has something they can't see. David has faith in Almighty God. And so David was taken before the king, and David said, the Lord, they said, you can't do this. He's been a warrior from his youth, which we don't know that he's been a warrior from his youth. That's the propaganda campaign. But anyway, David said, don't worry about it. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So you got to realize that David had already recounted earlier in the chapter that whenever a lion came after his sheep, now David had already been anointed by the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God would rush upon him, he could do things that he could not do in the natural. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. In the Bible it says, David said, I can run, I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. Now, Today, we kind of want to turn everything into metaphor, but I don't believe that was a metaphor. I believe when the Spirit of God came on his life, he could run like the flash. And he could leap walls in a single bound. He was the inspiration for Superman. And you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I'm preaching. I'm going to preach the way I want to preach. If you want to read it metaphorically, you are there to do that. But I want to read it the way I believe it is because I've experienced the power of the Spirit of God in my life. When the Spirit of God hits me, I can do things that I could not do when the Spirit of God is not on me. What I'm doing right now, I can't do unless the Spirit of God hits my life. You may not know that, but you don't know. If Anna Jo says all the time, if you only knew where I came from. You don't know who I really am. My wife knows who I really am, and she'll sit back there and she'll go, that ain't who he really is. <laughs> there was a guy named Smith Wigglesworth. It's okay if I take a little time this morning, okay? All right. So there was a guy named Smith Wigglesworth, and he was married to a lady named Polly. And he was a big old plumber. He got saved. Not as big as Goliath, but he was a big old guy because he was a plumber and worked hard and and this was back in like the late 1800s, maybe early 1900s, somewhere around there. So anyway, he got saved, and, uh, and, but he was a stutterer. He couldn't talk, very shy, could not stand in front of people, but he had a heart for, for, for people to get saved. And so he and his wife started a little uh, outreach to kids, and he would, he, would just, he, he, he would just go all out to reach kids, bring him there. But he couldn't talk, so he let his wife talk. He'd go get him, and his wife would talk to him. Right? So about that time, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, the empowerment of God began to be poured out. And they heard about it in England because he's in England. And uh, so anyway, he's hungry for it. He's hungry for it. He's hungry for it. And they, they were both, uh, uh, we already have that. We don't need something we already have. But he was still hungry, hungry, hungry. So the Lord led him to another place. And uh, short, long short, he, he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he came back and he told his wife, and she said, that, that, that's, we already have the Holy Spirit. We don't need the Holy Spirit. He said, no, this is powerful. He, he had an experience. The presence of the Lord came. She said, well, I'll tell you what. If you had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And she didn't believe it at all. She was just like, no way. She said, when we get the kids, you're going to get up there and you're going to preach. He was like, now what does the Bible say about the baptism? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, he already knows. She already knew it. He couldn't do it. There's many times he tried to do it. He'd just get up there and he'd, he'd freeze and he'd have to get his wife up there. So anyway, this time, she, they go and get the kids and instead of getting up there, she just sits on the front row like this. And he gets up there and all of a sudden, his tongue was loose wow. and he began to preach the most amazing message and she just kept sliding down her seat and all she could say, she called him Smitty, she could say, that ain't my Smitty. That ain't my Smitty. That ain't my Smitty. And see, the Spirit of God allowed him and empowered him to do something he could not do on his own. And by the way, she ended up getting baptized in the Holy Spirit after that. So anyway, David goes on finishing this text. He said, he said you come to me. David said to the Philistine, he went to Goliath firsthand, right, and said, you're fake news, man. He didn't say that. I'm just trying to make it relevant. He said, he said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defy. See, what I, I forgot, I didn't 
finish, is that when the Spirit of God would rush on David and a bear came and took his sheep and a, and a lion came and took his sheep, he went after them. And he outran them. And he grabbed them by the beard and he slew them. You cannot do that. You try doing that, uh, you know, up in Wyoming and Yellowstone Park. Or, uh, you, know, you try doing that and pretty soon they're going to come on the news. And it's not going to be fake news. person was killed. Mauled by a bear. Well, why could David do that? Because he was being empowered by the Spirit of God. And he said, and he was confident in what God could do and was doing in his life. He said, this day to the Philistine, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. He, I'm not letting you set the terms. I'm telling you what God's going to do. And I'm telling you prophetically and I'm telling you by faith, you're going down. He said, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You know what he was doing? He was prophesying. This is what God's going to do. Now, he wasn't prophesying to a four foot three, uh, uh, you know, little man in tights. He was prophesying to a nine foot plus giant of a man and I don't know if you know this but some scholars believe that David was about five foot tall small hands and this little five foot tall with small hands says by faith to that giant he said not only are you not going to win he said I'm going to come over there and I'm going to I'm going to give you and feed you to the carcasses of the earth and I'm going to cut off your head today you know why he did that? By faith. He believed not in what he could do. He believed in what God could do through him. Amen? And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Not that there is a David, but there is a God. You know, to be honest, I love it when people come in here, and I'm glad that you like my preaching, but I can't help you. I can't, but the God who works through me can. Now, I want to do is I want to preach the Word of God to you because it's the Word of God that contains power. It's God's Word and faith in God that releases the power of God. My, the best thing you could ever do if you really want to compliment me is, is, and compliment us as a church is when I walk in here, I felt the Spirit of God's presence. Because he's the only one that can change our life. He's the only one that can heal your body. He's the only one that can save your soul. He's the only one that can make a difference in us. It's Jesus. And so we lift up Jesus. Because Jesus is faithful. Jesus is good. Jesus is merciful. But Jesus is powerful. He healed the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out devils. And he didn't do, do it back then. The same God is here today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's not a favor. He doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't show partiality. So if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for you. Well, what do I got to do to be able to access that? You just have to believe. For the battle is the Lord's, David says, and he will give you into our hands. The Bible says in Psalms 103, verse 7, that God made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. What are the ways of God? One of the ways of God is that God created this world in such a way that the invisible world or the spirit realm is to influence the visible world. Yes. Hebrews 11 and 1, I've already said it, but I like the amplified version. It says, faith is the assurance or the confirmation or the title th deed of the things that we hope for being the very proof of the things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. John 1 and 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. John 4, 23 and 24. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is Spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And in 2 Corinthians 4.18, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 
vice versa, the enemy's plan, knowing how God created the world to operate, is to intimidate and manipulate the people of God with the problems of the visible to influence the invisible, which is our faith. He does so with the goal of getting us to capitulate, to submit by falling into unbelief. He uses the things in the natural to influence in such a way that we allow the problems to influence our faith and in doing so affect our very beings. Why does the enemy work this way? Because I don't know if you know this, but for the Christian, he has no legitimate authority. He must accomplish his agenda by lying and deceiving God's people in order to achieve his purposes. In John 8, 44, Jesus said, you, talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because of how they were behaving and what they wanted to do, they wanted to kill Jesus. He said, you are the, of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God created the world this way. He said, let there be light. You know how it goes. And then when he got to Adam, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, he's talking to mankind, humanity, Adam and Eve. Eve was in Adam at the time. Let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, we're not talking about people. I know there's a lot of creeps out there, but that's not what we're talking about. Now listen, what I'm trying to get you to realize is that God designed the world from the very beginning and put humanity in charge of this world, but he would walk with man in the garden. And out of the fruit of that relationship, man was supposed to spread God's ways, God's culture into the rest of the planet. You hear what I'm saying? There is a culture to the kingdom of heaven. And what we learn, what we're supposed to learn when we read this is not just information. We're supposed to learn the culture of the kingdom. We're supposed to learn how do things work in heaven. Learning how things work in heaven, we're supposed to live in accordance with the way heaven works, not the way this world works. Well, you know, in this world, they lie, steal, and, chill, steal and cheat, and that's how they get ahead, and that's how they do things. Well, that may be how the world works, but it's not how the kingdom of God works. Well, if I don't do the way things happen in the world, I'll never get ahead, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that by faith, if we trust in God, God will promote you. Humble yourselves in the hand of God, and He will lift you up. He will raise you up. Well, how's it going to work? It doesn't work. How? I, I can't see it. See, that's where faith comes in. Faith is that God is bigger, and God is more powerful, and God can really do anything He wants. And all of a sudden, you're believing that, and here's this big giant of a problem that shows up that tells you, <laughs> God can't get over me. God can't work, uh, uh, this, you know, because I'm here and I'm going to stand in your way and I'm going to do this. And, you know, he's not really telling you that, but the enemy's using him to tell you that it'll never happen. It's never going to, you're never going to get healed. You're never going to get out of debt. Your marriage is never going to be restored. Nothing's going to change in your life. But this Bible is a record of all those who trusted in God and how they saw God change things in their life. I'm here today. Because I, I put my faith in God. And God changed my life. There are many people that are here today. Uh, uh, that they're here today because they trusted in God. And God did what the doctors or he did what the family or he did what, what your counselor says could not do. He saved, healed, delivered and set people free. Well that's not the way the world works. We don't live according to this world. We live according to the kingdom of God. And we believe that God can and will do anything on behalf of his people. He paid a price for his children to be set free. Well, why aren't I accessing it? Why aren't I, why aren't I seeing an evidence of that? Because we access it by faith. That's why we preach the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Well, I believe, but I still haven't seen it. Well, sometimes there's something about corporate faith. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put ten thousand to flight. When as believers, not converts, not attendees, not members, but as believers, people that are actively putting their faith in God, trusting God, believing God, they come together and they begin to access openings, uh, create portals, openings in the heavenly realms that more and more people experience the glory of God, the presence of God, and the manifest power of God in their lives. Man was given authority and has been given dominion over every living thing. The serpent at the beginning, who was a creeping thing, was then only able to under, un, overcome the man through deception. He deceived him, and they willingly gave up their rights and privileges when they violated God's will. And that's what the enemy wants you to do, is he wants you to, to he can't pull you out of God's hand, but he will deceive you into stepping into sin. And when you step into sin, then the enemy can do whatever he wants in your life. Well, what do I do if I find myself there? If you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive us of all our sins because he's a merciful God and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we come under the shadow of the Almighty, then the enemy no longer can do what he was doing in your life. Doesn't mean you don't go through difficult things and hard things. It's just sometimes life is just hard. Sometimes it's not an enemy. Sometimes it's just life. All right? So anyway, at the very end, I'll shorten this up a little bit. Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Jesus came, uh, preached, died, rose again, came to the disciples, and he says, because uh, the enemy had stolen the authority from man whenever man sinned, devil took the authority over this planet. That's why the scripture says he's God over this planet. Matthew 28, Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. In other words, I got it back. I got back the authority. All right? And then he tells the disciples to go. Go do what? Make disciples of all nations. How am I going to do that? You're going in my authority. In Luke 10, 19, it says, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and upon all the powers of the enemy, and, and uh, nothing shall by any means harm you. Right? So who has been given authority? We have. But because we live in a real world, we still face real problems. We're still growing. We're still becoming like the Lord. Listen, we'll never be perfect. We strive to perfection, but we'll never be perfect. We're still human people. We're still frail. We're still weak. We go through difficulties. We have trials because of that. And there's still an enemy running around. And he's pretty good at his job. We often fall prey to his deceptions. We fall prey to the problems that are afflicted upon us, the, 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 the bad reports, the, the bad news. You know the Bible's called good news. How come you never turn on the TV and get good news? Did you know that's propaganda? It's a perspective because good news doesn't sell in this world. Bad news sells. So you've got to create a dependence if you can create a dependence, people will keep coming back. You're going to die tomorrow. You turn in. Well, we didn't die. We better check the news again. Yeah, but you're going to die tomorrow. Well, we didn't die. You better check the news again. Oh, it's going to be even worse tomorrow. And you create a dependence. But listen to us, and we'll tell you what you got to do. Right? That's, that's what it's doing. But the Bible is not bad news. The Bible is good news. And we've been charged to preach good news. But if we don't believe in good news, if we believe that everything's getting worse, if we believe that everything's getting darker, if we believe that there is no more light in this world, then we're not going to disseminate any good news. We're just going to agree with the world and disseminate bad news. But we're called the light of the world. And Jesus, when, I mean God in the beginning, he said, let there be light. So we've got to stop speaking darkness 
And we've got to stop being instruments of hopelessness. And we've got to start standing like David did, believing that God can and will change the situation, the problem, the family, the community, the nation. Ephesians 1, 18-23. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you've been called. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance? Not in heaven, in the saints. Because Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. Right? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us? And we want to stop there. But it's not toward us. It's toward us who believe. What does it mean to believe in God's immeasurable power? It looks like David going out against the Philistine. It looks like the church who doesn't buy the fake news and the propaganda campaign of today. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. So if Jesus is the feet, I mean if Jesus is the head and we're the body and the devil's underneath his body, then that means the devil's underneath us. That means the devil's underneath your feet. But he's not going to tell you that. He's going to tell you the scripture's wrong. He said, just put your hand over here and feel that lump. That ain't right. Just, just go over there and look at, look at that person that hurt you. That ain't right. Just go over there and look at your paycheck. That ain't right. That, ain't, ain't it? that scripture's wrong. Isn't that what he did with Eve? And he's trying to convince you that he knows what's right. You can't ever be free of drugs. You can't ever be free of this. You can't ever be free of that. You can't ever be free of that. Don't put your trust in what God says. Put your trust in what I say. He's a liar and he's a thief. So if the church has been given authority, how is it that the enemy continues to have such apparent power over God's people? As I said before, it's through deception. Through intimidation, manipulation, and intimidation, his purposes are to lead God's people into capitulation. I like that line. I'll say it again, only because I like it. (laughs) Through intimidation, manipulation, and intimidation, his purposes are to lead God's people into capitulation. (laughs) And we're almost done. (laughs) The enemy seeks to steal your faith. It's 1 Samuel 17, 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. The devil takes advantage of our ignorance and through fear seeks to lead us into unbelief. By the way, he was talking about Goliath. John 10 and 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You think really what he's after is your health and all that. But no, in coming after that, what he really wants is your faith. What did Job's wife say to him? Curse God and die. See, that's what the enemy wants. It's not all the bad stuff, but Job continued to maintain his trust in God. The enemy seeks to steal our faith. uh, uh, 1 John 5, 4 through 5, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now, how does the enemy steal our faith? It happens when we don't know who God is. We have an experience with God, but we don't know who they really are. See, when I got married, you know, I, I was all in love, and she was all in love, you know. And then, uh, then we got married, we moved in together, and after a while, I'm sure she looked at me and said, Who is this man? <laughs> it ain't the one that I thought. He's a little different than what I thought. And I looked at her and I said, Who is this woman? She ain't what I thought she was, right? Not in the sense she's a, she's a good woman, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you're dating, oh, man, you, you, you just, everything is like you're walking on the moon. Uh, everything smells like roses. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you get married and you realize, hey, you know, he didn't put up his clothes like I thought he did, you know. Or, you know, he, 
he needs a, he needs a different kind of deodorant, you know. <laughs> so we get, a, we get an experience with God, and we think we know who God is, but we don't. You got to walk with him. You got to talk with him. You got to get to know him. You got to find out who God really is. He, he's not going to change, but we change when we encounter who he really is. And sometimes who we think God is is not really who he is. We've been taught who God is by tradition, by legalism, by all sorts of different things, but we don't really know who he is. But if you get to know who he is, he just might surprise you. Well, I thought he was a, he was a rough and tough, you know, uh, 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 God that he doesn't, he, he don't accept anybody and he's mean and he's judgmental and he's condemning. No, he's a very loving God, merciful God. He said, how do I know that? Because when you were in trouble, he said, I'm not going to just let this happen. Over my dead body, am I going to let my people go to hell? And he did something about it. So it happens when we don't know who God is and when we're not aware of all that God has done for us and what God is doing in us. It happens when we lose faith in the face of opposing giants. And I actually realized the reason I'm preaching from my notes is because this should have been a part four because I didn't want to leave it with the enemy seeks to steal your faith. Part four would be fight the good fight of faith. This is the encouragement for you. This is how we win. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, some of y'all read that and you forget that it says fight. We know how to fight. If you're married, you know how to fight. Huh? Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth, right? I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying it's, it's something that we aspire to. I'm just saying we know how to fight. You got kids? You know how to fight? Kid says, uh-uh. You say, uh-huh. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. I have two dogs. I'm safe talking about my dogs, even though one of them will chew on me when he gets home. I heard you were talking about me. And we got one, he's a, he's a, he's a schnoodle, and he, he gets absolutely upset when we're gone. He fusses at us when we get home. He just, rah, 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 and I know what he's saying. <laughs> he wants to be the boss. I said, let's go. I said, we're gone. He said, I said, I don't think you know what I said. You're going to go. And he goes because he has to, right? Because he's not the boss in that house with my dogs, not with my family. <laughs> I'm the boss. And we're going to keep fighting until they learn that I'm the boss. So what I'm trying to get you to realize is that if you think the Christian life is all spas and getting your nails done and all that kind of stuff, you're not reading the same scripture. It says, fight the good. Fight! Fight! Why do we capitulate? Why do we submit to the enemies and to the lies of the enemy? Why don't just we accept everything he throws us? It's because we don't know who God is, and we don't know who God is that lives inside of us. Greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No tongue that is raised shall stand. If God be for me, who can stand against me? Fight! You don't know who you are. You're David's in disguise. The Spirit of God clothes himself with you. And he said, if you'll just trust me, I'll use you to take out Goliath. Isn't that what's really happening in our text? The enemy's engaged in a propaganda campaign to steal the faith of the people so that in fear they refuse to fight and ultimately submit to the enemy's rule in their lives. Thank God for David. David's strength 
was ultimately his faith in God. Hebrews 11, 32 through 34 confirms it. What more shall I say? For time would fail to tell me of for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered or subdued kingdoms, enforced justice, and tame promises, stopped the mouths of lions. What made David victorious was his faith. His eyes were not on the visible opposition in front of him, but the invisible God who was with him. David said to the Philistine, once again, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And just to make it even all the worse, I'm going to kill you with this little bitty rock. That's not in the scripture. <laughs> but I'm sure David was like, hey, God, just a little bitty rock. Just use it and take him down. And God did. In marching out with Goliath, the Philistines revealed to us the enemy's plan in this battle against the people of God. His plan is through a cleverly, cleverly based system of propaganda and deception to steal our faith. His aim is for believers to no longer believe. He robs you of your identity. You're a believer. He uses the visible obstacles to influence us in such a way that we allow them to rob us of our faith and in doing so affect our ability to live overcoming Christian lives. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. What does he tell the Christians? Resist him, standing firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. 1 John 5 and 4, Everyone who has born of, been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone. Well, no, that's you, you, Pastor. That's just the deacons. No, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Revelations 12 and 11, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They stood up for God when everything around them was saying, bow down and die, or die. They said, no, we're going to stand up for God. And by the way, it wasn't just the word of God, it was also the word of their testimony. You know what the enemy has stolen from the church today? Our testimony. Everybody already knows. Everybody already heard. Oh, I don't need to do that. No. He knows that if he can steal your testimony and people will no longer hear your testimony, he is taking away your weapons. Because it's by the word of the Lord, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of our testimony because we did not love our lives, even to the point of death. Mm -hmm.